Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar organized by Transmetrics. The topic of this webinar is supply chain forecasting from theory to practice. And we are very happy that you're joining us uh, today. We hope that this webinar is a very interesting one for you, and you will be able to uh, learn a lot of new things and a lot of new insights on this topic. Let me first start with presenting the speakers today. My name is Karolina Kolova and I work as account executive at Transmetrics. We also have a very special guest joining us today, Mr. Nikola Vandeput. He is an author, a consultant, and he is also a, an expert on the topic of demand forecasting. He'll be happy to share more information with us on the topic of uh, demand forecasting. And uh, you can also ask him questions in the chat and in the questions section as well. Then we also have a data scientist from Transmetrink, Ngo Kyong. He will be able to share with you more on the practical side of how demand forecasting is actually implemented in today's world and um, how logistics companies can start utilizing it. In the end, I will uh, briefly describe the impact of uh, demand forecasting and of uh, optimization of operations and how it can actually impact your business in a positive way, as well as the environment. In the end, we'll have also 15 minutes for any questions you might have for me, for Nikola or for Ngo Kyung. You can ask them, as I mentioned, both in the question section and in the chat section, and we'll be happy to answer them. There will be also some interesting polls, which you'll be able to see and vote. But first, let's start with the big picture. So right now, the logistics industry is generating a lot of uh, quantities of data and insights every day. However, only a portion of this data is being used nowadays. And of course, this leads to some negative results. For example, the service levels are not as high as they can be. And also, um, the utilization of resources is not done in a good way. The demand and supply are usually not well aligned because companies simply cannot um, estimate the demand at certain port, for example, or certain hub. This leads to increase in logistics costs and also to pollution in the environment. This comes directly as a result because logistics companies are stuck with legacy technology, leading to those poor user experience, low service levels, and also increased costs. If logistics companies want to change this, they should start looking at a different direction by enhancing functionality and embracing innovation. And demand forecasting and optimization of planning is one of the first steps that should be followed if logistics companies want to start being um, more competitive on the market, especially in the following years. Having said that, I'm giving the floor to Mr. Nikola Vandeput, who would uh, share with you more insight on the topic. Perfect. Thank you, uh, Karina. It's a, it's a pleasure to be uh, here today with you and uh, the people attending. I've, I've recognized some uh, known names, so uh, hello, everyone. Um, I would like, before I start the, the first slide, to introduce my work. Um, I like to spend my time writing books about forecasting and inventory optimization. I'm also teaching at uh, universities while well, forecasting and inventory. I'm training professional in these two fields and I'm also a consultant, as you can guess, specialized in forecasting and inventory optimization. Well, through my project and my teaching, I created a kind of a four dimension framework to be sure that if you work on forecasting, you can basically be sure that you're following um, the best practices. Um, so can I, if you mind to, uh, can I not to go to, to the next slide? Um, so the idea of this framework is really that we're going to go through it like some kind of a journey step by step. And for each step, you, as you listen to this, you will be able to basically think about your own supply chain and objective, trying to understand what do you need to forecast? How do you track if you're doing a good forecast? And finally, how do you set up your process, right? So it's a, a four step process, four step journey. And the objective is to reach um, best in class. Before we, we, we dive in, I would like to take a step back and try to understand and ask the question, but why do we need, why do supply chain need to forecast demand? I think it's extremely important that before jumping into something, try to understand, but what do I want to achieve here? Like, why do I do this? Uh, often data scientists like me, we just jump into a model and we ask the question after, 
Like, but why are we even doing this model? So here, let's just take a minute trying to think, but why do we need to forecast demand? Um, I see here we have a chat. So maybe if you do not mind, would you um, share some ideas on at your own supply chain? Why do you think you need to forecast demand? So there is the, the chat on the upper uh, right part of your screen. If you wouldn't mind to type a few answers, why do you think we should forecast demand? That will do some interaction. I, I see Jeff is typing already. Thank you, Jeff. And second person as well. That's great. Plan the future. That's great. We need an ID for probabilistic outputs. That is an amazing uh, answer. Thank you, Jeff. Yes, Elena, it's perfect as well in order to be prepared. I love it. Optimal planning. That's that's exactly it. So I think your answers makes a lot of sense. There is one answer that I've never received. I've been asking this question for years to hundreds of professionals and students alike. There is one thing that no one ever told me. It's the following one. Well, we forecast demand just because we want to be good at it and we want to do some good math. This is not what we want to do, right? We want to plan for the future. We want to have an idea of what is going to happen. We want to be prepared. Right, so I see a supply chain as something like a, a living organism that needs to take so many decisions. You know, how much to produce, do we need to hire people, should we open a plant, should we close a warehouse? As we forecast demand, we get information, we get pieces of information that allows us to do the right action. So, Carolina, if you can just move on to the slide. So really, at, at, at the core of this uh, framework, the question is, we need to take action, and this is why we are doing demand forecasting, so that we can take the best decision, so that we can take the right action. Okay, let's start in this process by discussing granularity and temporality. In terms of granularity, as you can imagine, we can do a lot of different forecasts. You can forecast per product, you can forecast per brand, per product family, you can forecast uh, per store, per market, per region, per warehouse, you can forecast at a global level. So actually, when you think about it, you have some kind of a huge matrix of all the type of granularity, geographical ones and material ones, where you can possibly do a forecast, right? And you need to pick the right one. Karina, if you can just move on. Perfect. It's the same for the temporality. You can do a forecast per day, you can do the forecast per week, per month, or per year. But it's the same for the horizon. You can forecast for the next two months, six months, 18 months, and so on. Well. Based on my expertise with uh, clients and supply chain, I see that a lot of supply chain are simply doing a forecast per product for 18 months. And it seems to be the baseline solution that if you want to set up any demand forecasting process, people will just stick to, let's do a forecast for 18 months. Um, my opinion is that this is simply not optimal. Let me show you why this is not optimal. But first, the question is, if you can just go one slide up. Mm -hmm. Sorry for that, Karina. The question is, OK, Nicola, I understand I can do so many different forecasts on product, on country, per warehouse, and so on, over days, over month, and so on. But how do I choose which one's the correct one, right? How do I know, for me, my own supply chain, which is the right granularity I should use? Well, again, you should just keep in mind, and that's what people have been putting in the chat, that what really matters is the kind of action, the kind of decision you need to take, right? Do you need to produce stuff? Do you need to ship product, and so on? Based on these kind of questions, based on the action you want to do, you will know what is the right granularity for you. Okay, we can then move on to the next slide. So let me show you a few examples of different kind of role in a supply chain that will need different kind of information. Um, over the short term, let's take the example of a logistic uh, manager. So, Karina, if you can go to the next slide. Perfect. Over the short term, you might just think like how many products do I need to ship to this very specific warehouse or to this very specific store? Do I need to uh, ask people to do extra hours and so on? In order to reply to these kind of question, you need to have a very granular forecast, but just for the few days or weeks ahead, right? If you're a logistic manager and you need to know, okay, do I need to deploy goods to the local warehouse or do I need to ship goods to the, the, the neighboring country? If you receive a forecast of the next let's say three weeks, that's just good enough for you, right? You just need three weeks of forecast, but you need this forecast to be accurate, okay? So in the example here, I said, okay, 
if you're a logistic manager, you need to have a good forecast per SKU per store per week. Now let's take a look at the midterm. If we can move on with the slide, great. If you are a plant manager, you maybe do not need a forecast per week. Instead, you need a monthly forecast. You need to have like a view over the next three to six months in order to know how much you should produce. But you don't need to have a forecast per store. No, you might need to have a global forecast because yourself, you're, doing, you're going to produce goods for the whole world. So you don't exactly need to know for which store you're going to produce. Right? So we see that the plant manager will need to have a forecast per SKU, but at a global level and per month. Okay. Finally, um, if you look at, let's say, for example, a marketing strategist, the marketing strategist is really looking for the long term. And this person will only be interested into what's the total forecast at the brand level. And it's not even per month, but maybe the forecast per quarter or per year. Such a person will maybe be interested into the consumption per country or per market, but for sure not per store. Okay. So again, we see that in a supply chain, different roles needs different kinds of information, different kinds of inputs, different kinds of forecast in order to take the best decision, right? Yourself, as you're reading this slide, you might be thinking, okay, I am this logistic manager, or no, I'm more like this plant manager, or no, I'm more like this marketing strategist person. So I need a different kind of forecast, right? Um, now the question is, the next one is, okay, Nicolas, thank you for this explanation. I understand we have a lot of granularities and I need to pick one based on the decision I need to take. Makes sense. But how do we deal with the fact that in a supply chain, we have different teams that needs to have different kind of granularities. Yeah, that, that's, that's, a, that's a real challenge. Um, the, the old school approach would be to say, well, if we have the right software, we can align all these forecasts, right? So if you have a forecast per, let's say, store per product, you can easily uh, sum up this forecast per uh, country per brand, right? So you can easily change the, basically the scale of the forecast and it would make a lot of sense. And as we can do that, we will be sure that every single team in the supply chain receives an aligned forecast. Karana, if you can move on in the slides. Perfect. So technically, we can do such a thing, but it comes with challenges and issues. Basically, mathematically, the optimal forecast at a very low granular level, for example, the forecast per SKU, per week, per store, the, the tool that's going to do that, the algorithm that's going to populate this forecast, will be very good at this very granular level it will be very bad at a very aggregated level. For example, to predict the demand per country over the next 18 months. The same tool will not be suited to do both a very granular forecast and a very aggregated forecast. You just cannot have both. You get some other challenges. Um, over the long term, you have a lot of stores that's going to open and close. You're going to have a lot of new products, a product that's going to phase out. It's extremely difficult to keep track of that for the next 18 months. Can you imagine the process if every week you need to forecast the next 18 week per store in the whole world for each and every single product you have? It's going to be a nightmare, right? And yet, at the short term, the logistic manager needs to have a forecast per store per product per week. One potential solution to that is not to force everyone to be aligned on the same page, but more to say to everyone, well, you are allowed to have your own process with your own model as long as the overall picture is still aligned. So if the logistic manager sees a promotion is coming in, the person doing the, let's say, global forecast, or the plant manager, we also see this promotion coming. So people get the same pieces of information about marketing, about pricing, about uh, phasing in, phasing out, SNOP things, stuff like that. And yet people can populate their own forecast using their own model. Right, it's um, it's kind of a new approach. Not a lot of supply chain do that already. But if you think about this kind of old school approach of forcing everyone to line on single number, this is creating a lot of well friction in the supply chain. I would be I, I would love to discuss that later in, in the chat with you. Let's then move on to the next one, Karina. Mm -hmm. Yeah, perfect. Let's now discuss a bit. Uh, the, the, the metric. So if you remember, we started discussing granularity and temporality. Now we're going to discuss the metrics quite uh, quickly. So in terms of forecast accuracy, when you try to track if a forecast is accurate or not, you can basically do two things. 
You can track accuracy, how close are you to the target, and you can track something else that's called the bias, which is, in average, are you too high or too low, OK? So you can see on, on the screen here an illustration showing that you can have cases where you're like always too high but close to the target, or you could also be always too low but also close to the target, which is kind of annoying for supply chain if you always over or under forecast. Now, the question of metric is kind of complex. Usually at university, I can teach this for more than two hours. So here we just do it in a few minutes. But one of the main ideas is that you really need to align the metric you're going to use with the objective you have in mind. And picking the right metric is kind of a very difficult exercise, and you don't have, and it's very unfortunate, you do not have a perfect metric. OK? Let's maybe move to the next slide. Mm -hmm. So overall, I would say that you have three types of metric that people use most of the time in supply chain, MAE, MAPE, and RMSE. Um, I recently ran a poll on, on LinkedIn about this, asking people, what kind of metric are you using? And I saw that out of 700 people that replied, more than 70% of them used MAPI. It's very unfortunate because MAPI is a very biased KPI. So if you yourself are tracking MAPI today, you basically open the door for anyone to hack your forecast. Because if you populate a forecast that's very low, you might reach the best MAPI. Instead, a better practice would be to track both MAE and bias. And that's usually what supply chain tends to do. Um, now you can move even further by using what I describe as weighted metrics. So what is that? Well, if you think about your supply chain, so you have a whole portfolio of items, right? You have some items that are very important, some items that are less important. What we could do when we track uh, the metrics is that we're going to allocate more importance to the more important item and less importance to these, well, items that do not matter so much. OK, that would be the best practices in terms of KPI. Now, I would like to do a poll with you. And great, it's, it's uh, on now, asking you what kind of metric are you using right now? So you can go again on the upper uh, right part of your screen. You see polls. And there you have a question concerning the KPI. Uh, I'm going to take a look at the results. Perfect. So I see. Yeah, four votes already. That's great. Thank you. So if if you go on the upper right side of the screen, you can see the, the poll there. So you can just say which metric you are using right now. Uh, you have to choose between MAPI, MAE, uh, weighted MAE, or RMSE. And I see that 60% of people are still using MAPI. Um, Again, unfortunately, MAPI is a very, very skewed metric. So I would really advise you to switch from MAPI to MAE or RMSE. Actually, you can switch from MAPI to anything else. It will still be better. That would be a, a good advice for this session. OK, so we discuss metric. Let me finish by discussing process uh, quickly. Thank you, Karina. Um, let's imagine for this last part of this framework, a very simple cases where you have a a forecast based on, and then you have three steps in the process. First, the demand planners. Can I know if we can move? Great. So the demand planners are looking at your forecast baseline. They are typing some changes in the forecast plan. And let's say that they create values, they discuss with the clients, they take care of product introductions, they're doing a great job. Then the sales teams come in. The sales teams, they want to secure inventory, OK, because they are afraid of bad service levels, so they just overinflate a bit the forecast so that they're sure to uh, have enough inventory. Then let's move to the consensus meeting. Consensus meeting, some manager a bit afraid that, well, the supply chain is not on track with the budget, so they're going to change the forecast again to be realigned with the budget. What we see on this process is that um, you have some teams that really try to forecast the demand, and you have other teams that are just trying to pull or push the forecast in a very specific direction so that the forecast is aligned with some of the objective, but it's not really aligned with the real demand. So you, if you're the manager of a demand forecasting process, you want two things to happen. First, you want efficacy. You don't want people to tweak the forecast if they do not create value, right? So you don't want people to go in the forecast and change it if they don't make it better. On the other hand, you want people to be efficient. You don't want people to spend two weeks editing the forecast if they cannot add so much value, right? Let me show you how we can do that. 
So there is a thing called forecast value edit. And in this thing, we're going to track the forecast value edit of each step in the process. So for each step in your demand forecasting process, we're going to track how much accuracy or how much forecast error they achieve. As we're going to track the forecast error of each step, we're going to know, well, which step is doing a good job, which step is creating value, and which step is removing value. So I give you an example here on the upper right part of the screen, where you see that, for example, the planners got an error of uh, 68%. So they did a great job. They improved the model compared, they improved the accuracy compared to the model, but the sales teams they couldn't treat really. it. Okay, so that's an issue. How comes? As shown on the previous slide, sales team was just trying to secure inventory, so they are not doing a great job in terms of forecast. Finally, the consensus meeting is also not adding value because they're also just moving the forecast to be aligned with the budget. Um, forecast value added is it's really great to be tracked. It's, it's the number one advice I'm giving to supply chain. When people call me and ask me, okay, Nicola, what can I do to improve my forecast accuracy? The number one thing I advise them to do is start by tracking forecast value added. You know, my expertise is to create very advanced machine learning model for clients, but actually my first advice is let's not use neural network. Let's start with forecast value added. That's the best way to improve your forecast. Finally, a question that, and, and I think I will finish with this, question that often people ask me at the end is, okay, but what do we do with team that don't increase value? Do we just, and someone said it, it's not me, said, should we terminate this team? No. The answer is no, you should not terminate anyone. The question is really, how can we help people to do a better job? How can we reduce the amount of politics involved in this process? And how can we make sure that as a group, as a team, we just achieve um, a better accuracy? Um, I think that's it for me. Uh, is there another slide? I don't think so. Ah, further reading, obviously. If you're interested into forecasting models, you can check my book. It's on the upper side of the screen. If you're interested in forecast value added model, you can check the book from uh, Mike Gilliland. It's an amazing book about uh, demand forecasting process. Finally, a last poll. Um, if you do on the poll, I've asked the question, are you tracking your self forecast value added? And it's very interesting because we have a 50-50 uh, reply. So we can go there to put your own reply. Um, again, my number one advice for you is if you want to improve forecast accuracy, you should really start by implementing this in your process. Right. Thank you so much for this interesting interactive presentation. It was uh, very interesting to learn from an expert like you. And uh, now we are having, unfortunately, some technical difficulties. Uh, so our data scientist from Transmetric, Ngo Kyong, is not able to join in this moment. But I think that it, it would be a very good idea to still uh, discuss the practices. So I can uh, maybe start by saying what we are doing. And then, uh, Nicola, if you can move on with giving a bit of more uh, practical advice. Are you OK with doing that? Can I start this? Yeah. Okay, great. Then I can, if you want, I can first uh, introduce briefly Transpetric on the slide, and then I'll give the floor again to you because I believe that it will be a very interesting one for um, our audience. Uh, so at Transmetrics, the forecasting, uh, what we're trying to do is to uh, cracking complex data problems that really uh, require the mathematical thinking and the modeling. And our number one goal would be to understand our customers' needs and to uh, then formalize all of the information, all the constraints and everything else mathematically. After this, we are trying to um, basically discover some hidden patterns from the raw data that our customers are giving us. And the good thing is that we are able to um, work with uh, any type of data that our customers are having. And then we are running time series analysis. Then we are finding and converting those mathematical signal in data into different business decisions. We have a great uh, uh, team of uh, mathematicians and data scientists, data scientists who are actually taking care of this. And now a bit about the augmented intelligence. We are trying to offering best of both worlds, basically. We are using artificial intelligence in our software as a service solution to do the um, uh, predictions, to handle big data, to run different what if scenarios, fallback decisions, etc. And all of this is automated because artificial intelligence can do it in ways in which simply the human mind is not able to do. 
However, when uh, people hear artificial intelligence, they're often a bit scared because it may sound like um, somebody would replace the person, etc., which is not the case. This is why we call it augmented intelligence, because the artificial intelligence uh, our algorithms are just doing the repetitive stuff. And we want to automate those repetitive stuff. But still, the planner, the human expert is needed because he or she is the one with the most experience, with the knowledge, with the gut feeling, and this is indeed vital for predictions in case of um, some unreliable data or in case that um, the gut feeling of the planner is uh, telling him that something could happen. This is why we would like to call it um, like a combination, the best of both worlds. So, uh, Nico, do you want to take it from here? Uh, yes, sure. Um, so I will do my best to uh, take back the slides from our uh, colleagues. Um, I think something that was very important is, in his presentation was how do we merge the expertise of people with the accuracy of models? And this is a question we receive from a lot of uh, people in a lot of fields. Okay, we have machine learning, we have artificial intelligence, we have some big models, but how can we merge this with the expertise we have uh, in-house? Um, can you move with a few slides down? Not this one. I will not be able to understand this one. Um, okay, I thought that was another slide. Okay, let me just explain this slide. Perfect. So in terms of demand forecasting, um, I, I like to say that the more information you can bring to the model, the better your model is going to have as an output, especially within machine learning. So typically, what do you want to do with a forecasting model? You need to flag a lot of seasonalities. Uh, daily seasonalities from Monday to Sunday, weekly seasonalities, monthly seasonalities. And as we all understand, the kind of mon the, the kind of seasonalities you're going to get in Europe, in the US, and in China will be absolutely different. We have different holidays. We have different uh, specific days. So the seasonality will be different in every uh, country. Um, and, and, and here on the slide, we mentioned Black Friday. I mean, this one is especially uh, famous. Uh, concerning the geo information, unfortunately, that is not my expertise. So I will not be able to um, explain it that well. Uh, maybe we can move to the next slide. Mm -hmm. Great. So in this case here, you really see the kind of impact of the trend plus the weekly seasonality as well as the monthly seasonalities. And I think that uh, our colleague wanted to mention the fact that if you are dealing with the, 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 for example, the sea traffic, if you know that you have some places in the world that is blocked, for example, the Canal de Suez, you're going to get some kind of an issue that's going to totally change your output. So you need to include this kind of information directly in your forecast because you know that if the canal is blocked, you can expect more or less boats in some places of the world. So it's not going to follow the expected seasonalities, of course. So if you want to do a good model, you need to load this kind of information directly into the model so that the model can react. Um, back to this question of expertise, and I think here it's, it's an amazing example. Um, you know, we, we have this kind of model using machine learning, using all this kind of external information, and then we have the human expertise. And for COVID, it's, it's, it's kind of a really good case as well. A model, you can feed as much data as you want. It will only be able to replicate what it saw in the past. So in the past, if you had Black Friday, the model might be able to replicate Black Friday next year because it saw Black Friday already. OK, makes sense. The model can only replicate things it saw already. If you include the pricing in your model, and if you do a price increase or a price decrease, the model might understand that if you did it in the past. Now, we, as human, we are able to create outcomes, to predict outcomes, even on things that never happened in the past. So if in 2019, I would have told you, OK, what would be the outcome if we get a global pandemic? Maybe, as human, we wouldn't be super accurate, but at least we can come up with some ideas, right? And that's a human expertise. A machine learning model, if you asked it, in 2019, what's the outcome if we get a global pandemic in 2020? The model would just look, OK, did we ever had a global pandemic before? No. So I cannot do an extrapolation of 2020. So you see that here, it's a very good illustration on when and how we should merge human judgment with forecasting uh, models. Um, can we go to the next line? Mm -hmm. This one, I will not be able to uh, explain it. Okay. Perfect. If you can go one side up. So here it's really what I just said of the, the question of how do we merge expertise with models? Something that's extremely important to do that, the best practices to do that, 
It's to understand what are the data that are fed to the model. Let's take back, uh, my previous example. If you have a model that takes into account pricing, and you as human, you know that we're going to increase price tomorrow, you should, not, you should not go in the forecast and change it because the model is already aware of it. On the other hand, if you have a model that is not aware that tomorrow is Black Friday, but we human, we know tomorrow is Black Friday and usually we sell 50% more, you should go in the forecast and change it. So we understand that in order to know when to update the forecast or not, we need to understand the model and we need to know what kind of data is taken into account. Moreover, and people are pushing in this direction, if we get something called explainable AI, the model might be able to tell us, okay, these are the things that really matters to me and these are the things that do not really matter to me. And as we understand better the model, we as humans get better and better at interacting with the model and improving the accuracy of the model. So when people say, um, is it model AI against human? No, that, that is not true. It's AI plus human. We need to work as a team to improve the forecast. Um, finally, these two last points, I think it's extremely uh, clever and important. As we started this webinar, we said, okay, the objective is to take action. The objective is that you need to make a decision. You're listening to me and you're thinking, but me, I need to know, do I need to have one truck, 10 truck, 100 trucks? Do I need to open a warehouse? Do I need to ship a thousand? Do I need to ship 2000? Forecasting is just a piece of information, but that's not the end objective, right? It's also a question of pricing, a question of capacity, a question of risk. So once you master forecasting, you need also to take a look at the rest of the flow and try to think, okay, I know that I have a certain probability to sell all these goods, but still it doesn't tell me how much I should ship. And in order to know how much I should ship, I need to do optimization, right? So here in terms of L&D challenges, the, the objective is to go from a simple forecast to I'm taking the right decision. And often people are asking, and I had this conversation many times on LinkedIn, um, okay, Nicola, it's great to improve forecast, but if I improve it by, let's say, 5%, what's the outcome? How, how much money am I going to make? Can I reduce my inventory? By how many percent can I reduce my inventory if I improve forecast by 5%? As you can guess, there is no reply to this. Uh, we, we, we do not know. There is no direct relationship. You can reduce your inventory if you take the right decision. Okay, and maybe reducing your inventory is not the right decision. Maybe you need even more inventory and this is going to increase your service level and increase your profits. We do not know that, right? So you could also improve your forecast and yet take very poor decisions. So you're going to get a really good forecast, but really bad decision and you will still be not profitable. On the other hand, you can optimize your inventory while keeping a very bad forecast. Everything is possible. Last point, and, and we really see that in the world of machine learning, we need to have very good data. And uh, I, I really know that when we launch a, um, a project, most of the project will be uh, about data cleaning. And that's a real issue because currently supply chain do not take so much time to clean the data. Uh, we don't pay attention to that. We, most of supply chain are not uh, data driven. And then when you really need to use the data for such a project, well, data cleaning can take a few weeks or even a uh, month. Um, I think that's it for this slide. I don't know if you have still other slides, Karina. No, that was enough. Thank you so much uh, for for jumping in here as well. Uh, also, uh, do not forget all the participants that you can ask any questions you might have uh, in the chat and in the questions section. We will be uh, able to respond them after this. And also, if you have some more specific questions on the data science uh, team on Transmetrics, please don't hesitate to contact us about them as well. We will be happy to share more information. And now I will discuss a bit um, the impact, the positive impact that uh, what we have just heard can actually have on the transportation and logistics industry. But first, let's look into the big picture. Logistics is indeed everywhere. And this is why it is so important that we have uh, reliance on reliable service because this is growing worldwide right now. There are a lot of uh, macroeconomic factors why um, it is so important to have a reliable service in the logistics industry, like, uh, for example, the growth of e-commerce and also the notion of uh, the connectivity between the world, between the different countries. And the industry, because of this high demand, it generates vast quantities of data every day, as we already mentioned. And those data can indeed be harnessed by uh, artificial intelligence and by demand forecasting, as uh, Nico just mentioned. 
Right now, let's look at the statistics. Only 12% of logistics companies use AI as of today. And by 2025, this percentage will grow to 60%. And as you can see, the difference is huge because 2025 is in just four years. And the reason for this is that um, basically uh, companies will start realizing how important that is, how important demand forecasting is, how important optimization is uh, for your business. And if logistics and transportation companies want to um, continue having high service levels and to be competitive on the market, they need to start being proactive by embracing innovation and technology as well. This is why the goal of our company, the goal of Transmetrics, uh, is to revolutionize the logistics industry by helping logistics professionals make more data-driven decisions. Now, let me tell you a bit about the problems in the logistics industry that are um, currently happening. So logistics has uh, some inefficiencies and they're major because planners are usually trying to optimize um, very vast and uh, very complex planning puzzle. And they're using um, Excel or other tools like Excel and just the human brain, just um, the gut feeling, which is so important, but it is not enough. And when they're using different tools like uh, Microsoft Excel, there is some time uh, data quality issues, as uh, Nicole mentioned. And this is very important because um, when you have, for example, different spreadsheets with information, sometimes data is missing, sometimes data is of bad quality. And of course, this hinders the planning process itself. As a result, transporters rarely adjust their capacity or um, resources to changes in the supply and demand, which means that the companies are being reactive instead of being proactive, and they do not know how to distribute uh, their resources in the most efficient way. This, of course, has a very negative impact on the bottom line revenue because a lot of logistics costs are being spent on that. Also on the maintenance frequency because companies do not know when the assets would break and on the environment because we are polluting there, we are breathing every day. But um, as people say, numbers speak even better than words. So let's look at the statistics. 24% of trucks driving in the EU is empty. 33% of the containers globally shipped are empty. And 66% of the time, logistics assets are just staying idle. And as you can see, and as you can imagine how huge the transportation logistics industry is, here we are talking for um, billions of empty kilometers, for millions of millions of costs. And uh, this definitely can be changed if uh, technology is being embraced. This is exactly what Transmetric is trying to do. We are an AI platform that is supporting logistics uh, service providers in order to help them digitalize their operations and their planning as a whole. We do realize that planning is key in logistics and we do realize that it is a very complex uh, business and that the task is very complex with razor thin margins. This is why we would like to help uh, the staff, to help the planning staff with augmented intelligence as mentioned. Because in the end of the day, the job of the planner becomes data driven, the outputs are more efficient and the planner has more time to concentrate on the stuff that really matter. Transmetrics is all-in-one solution because our platform, when we are building it specifically for our clients, um, they get a unique uh, code where they can log in with the username. Uh, we are ISO uh, certified, so the, the data of our clients is in safe hands with us. And then everything else is happening in Transmetrics. The platform is built from the future for the future because um, we are basically doing the cleaning of the data, analyzing of the data, uh, forecasting the demand, and also something uh, which is very important is uh, we already learned the optimization. Our platform is building the optimization plan based on which in the end of the day, the planner can decide how to distribute the fleet, uh, where there'll be a higher demand, um, let's say at a specific hub, so more trucks would be needed, etc. Now let's look at the traditional um, logistics supply chain. Let's, let's just see how it looks like in order to be able to make the comparison. So um, right now, many logistics companies are using legacy technologies, which as mentioned, leads to uh, inefficiencies and poor user experience. Because in the traditional methods, we have a planner, we have a system, 
like ERP or TMS system. And then we have a lot of manual processes happening, like analyzing the data manually, estimating capacity or trying to estimate the capacity, then analyzing the network, then the planning is done. And all of this is taking a lot of time, a lot of manual communication, and it is not done in the most effective way. With our AI platform, it is all different because it covers the whole logistics value chain. Now it is important again to mention that as you can see, the planner is uh, still present at our value chain because we do not replace the planner. We are just trying to enhance his or her work. Then we also do not replace the TMS. We just connect to the transport management system in order to extract the data. And after this, in everything is happening in our platform. There is a continuous loop of information because our, um, our system is always connected to the TMS, which means that the AI is learning all the time. And in five years, it's even becoming better. This is the, the essence of AI in the end of the day. And everything else, like cleaning the data, predicting the demand, seeing how many uh, trucks or containers you need at a certain port or hub, everything is in this system, in our system, together with all the reference data that you might have, anything, any business constraint, few adjustments, for example, or information about the subcontractors. Our technology is helping raise service levels because as mentioned, we are providing a lot of rich data insights. So our clients are able to see if they have some bottlenecks, if something is not working in the correct way, if there is a problem with the specific subcontractor, for example, also, we are ensuring that the planner experience is frictionless because um, he or she will be able to see everything in one place and we have more time to, to make the right decision, the most informed decision. And maybe one of the best thing is that uh, it is a global reach. All of this is in one platform. The commercial interests are completely aligned with the operational ones because everybody has one and the same source of truth. Now, let me tell you a bit uh, very quickly about one of the solutions we are offering. It's uh, regarding uh, the planning, the network, the line hole planning. And it is very appropriate for transportation companies like DPD, with, um, which are offering groupage business with complex networks. And what we are doing, we are suggesting the most optimal network plan to align the demand and supply. Uh, so companies know that at this hub, they will need that amount of tracks also it is divided by um, by what kind of uh, pallet it is and many other options. And the results are very important here because first of all, there is visibility. Uh, it is exposing the network bottlenecks, the inefficiencies as I mentioned, if any. It is also leads to, we have achieved so far around 10% reduction in total transportation costs. So in many cases, we are talking about millions, millions of dollars and 14% increase in capacity utilization, which is um, also huge. And uh, we have other solutions like asset positioning, uh, forecasting the last mile deliveries, and also um, maintenance planning, predictive maintenance. Uh, I would be happy to um, explore further with you. If you want to, you can always uh, you see my email in the end of the presentation, and we will be able to schedule a call. But now when we talk about the results, um, there are some results that are even bigger than me, than you, and than us um, as a whole, because this is just more than bottom line savings. I mean, um, we, here we are talking about uh, contributing to a cause and also uh, being uh, eco-friendly. And I think that is very important uh, thing to be mentioned, especially today, uh, because today is uh, Earth Day. And we know that the issue of uh, polluting the environment is huge right now. and um, this this can actually be also helped if um, if logistics companies try uh, and start planning their resources in a more optimized way because this would mean um, less empty trucks on the road less empty containers in the sea and less transportation would reduce carbon emissions and this will bring us all more fresh air a cleaner world and i think that's very important to be addressed um, even today because it is our uh, social responsibility and now a bit about our business model. It is a very simple one and very transparent. We usually have one time setup cost between three and five months. Uh, in these three and five months, the product is being implemented. Then it is based on the monthly recurring costs. Uh, every month, customers can cancel anytime. This hasn't happened yet. And 
we are also uh, have endless functionality. Our product is ready, but a part of it is being customized based to your specific needs, to your specific business constraints, because our number one priority is to make the product work for your specific business. And on this slide, you can see um, some of our customers, some of the companies uh, which um, has trust us. Uh, and uh, it's, an, it's interesting because you can see now that it's a shipping client. Um, Tip is one of the biggest uh, companies that's leasing trailers in the world. DPD, um, as mentioned, is managing very complex uh, networks. Ibrutor Vice um, is proficient at the last mile delivery. And as you can see, they are coming from these different sectors within the logistics and transportation industry but what unites all of those companies is that they have trusted us with uh, handling uh, with helping them to handle their operations in the most efficient way currently we have two offices uh, in Europe and we are trying to help clients globally hopefully um, maybe somebody who is watching this presentation uh, would also uh, find the fit between our companies and now, I also just want to mention that Transmetrix um, has received funding from the European Union's Horizon 2020 uh, project, Research and Innovation Program, for which we are very grateful. And also, now we'll uh, move to the questions. And I want, just want to mention again that you can contact me. You see my contacts there. And also, Nicola, our emails will be happy to take your questions. Thank you for the attention. And now, let me see the questions. Okay. Thank you, Yana. Okay. Okay, let's start. Okay, now I see that uh, we have a question from George that uh, if supply chain and forecasting is powered by AI and machine learning, can I control it? I would not want AI to take over the job from my team of planners. Yes, basically, this is one of the common mis, uh, misconceptions in uh, in our world that um, AI is replacing the human and we should be afraid of losing our jobs, which is mentioned is, is not the case. Um, it's not the case here because uh, usually what we do, you, the, the role of the planner is still kept. It is just enhanced so that the planner can go in, uh, he or she can check uh, what's the status. Also, we usually give the planner um, the option to manually adjust if um, his gut feeling is saying, for example, okay, maybe you need to have uh, more trucks at this hub. That's totally okay. This can be changed as well. Um, okay. Let's see some of the other questions. If you do not mind, can I, I, I read here a very interesting uh, question. No? Yeah. Go ahead, sure. Yeah, from uh, Solomon. Uh, he's asking, what is the acceptable uh, forecasting accuracy, accuracy in supply chain forecasting? When forecasting accuracy is low, how can we use it to optimize? It, it's two very good uh, questions. The first one I receive it so many times from so many, uh, well, students are not interested in that, but professionals ask me this question quite often. What is the benchmark? If I achieve this level of accuracy, is this good? Is this bad? Can I go higher or am I already at the top of the game? Um, often people say we should look at an industry benchmark, but I do not support this uh, view because industry benchmarks are extremely difficult to get and you're never exactly sure how it has been measured and who's sharing data and is it simply correct. Instead, there is an extremely simple way to do that and it's, it's basically uh, so simple, it's a hack. Um, Along with your forecasting process and forecasting model, you just run a moving average of the last, let's say, four weeks or four months, whatever moving average you want, and you compare your result to the moving average. Um, let me tell you that if you beat the moving average on, a mod, on, on, let's say, a product that's not so seasonal, if you beat it by 5 to 10%, you're doing a great job. If you beat it by more than 10%, it's amazing. On seasonal product, it's kind of easy to be the moving average, but maybe then you just need to look at last year's same period. Again, the idea is extremely simple. If you want to know if you're doing a great job or not, just compare your work to a simple benchmark. A moving average is perfect. Now you ask a second question. Okay, Nicola, but let's imagine my accuracy is really bad. How do I optimize? I don't think having a bad accuracy is bad. In some cases, you simply cannot predict properly the, the sales or the demand of things because it's so chaotic. It is fine. It's just randomness and this is the way it is. 
right? Nevertheless, you can optimize because you need to assess what's the risk if I have too much, what's the risk if I have too little, and based on these two risks, okay, this is totally beyond the webinar, but based on these two risks, you need to find the right balance in how much, let's say, inventory of capacity you need to have. And then if you come up with a probabilistic forecast trying to show the range of possible outcomes, you can pick the right, uh, let's say, level based on these two uh, risks. Uh, if you're interested, just to finish this question, uh, Salomon, I discussed that in my inventory optimization uh, book. Great. Great. Thank you. And here we actually have a one more question for you. If you can elaborate more on some particular examples of biases and how often they occur. Yes, sure. Uh, it's it's one of, actually, thank you for the question. It's one of my favorite uh, uh, subjects. We didn't dis discuss that so much, but in supply chain, when we do a forecast, what we want to do is really to forecast demand, unconstrained, unbiased demand. But a lot of teams have like what we call misaligned incentive. So some team wants to raise the forecast because they want to have more inventory. They want to have more supply. Some team wants to lower the forecast because, for example, they're going to get a bonus if they oversell compared to the forecast. As soon as you start to have teams that have different incentives, so they don't really want to forecast the exact demand, but they want to you know, push up or down, you start to have bias. So basically, you get bias, not because people are not good at forecasting, but because the rules of the game are rigged. Then you really need to explain to everyone, we can get to a forecast of 100, and yet we can supply 200 because we don't want to run out of stock. Nevertheless, we think that the demand is going to be 100. If you reduce the politics by this hack and a few other hack that, that I mean, we, we can discuss then out of the webinar, you can really reduce these political uh, biases. I think that was a great answer. Uh, we also um, have a question on how adaptive are forecasting models to the last minute changes and additions asked by uh, Mark. So uh, basically the forecasting models are very um, adaptive to, to those changes uh, because they usually, as mentioned, uh, we are usually connected to the TMS system of our clients. So every data that is entered there we are directly taking it because this continuous loop of information is continuing every day. So we are very adaptive to that. And also, as mentioned, um, the planner uh, can always change if they if they see that, for example, um, there there would be a change or they think that maybe some more trust would be needed. He or she can um, directly do this, and there is no problem uh, for this to be done. Um, Maybe that's still connected to the previous question on whether uh, the AI is repl uh, replacing the human, uh, which is not the case. Um, and uh, maybe even a simple example is now, um, as you saw, um, one of our colleagues couldn't join due to technical uh, due to technical reasons, and then you just need to um, to take up uh, the role and to try to explain further, for example. So in this case, of course, if you see that the optimization model is producing something, but your gut feeling, feeling is telling you something else about the specific location, of course, um, th this would be always welcome to, uh, to see the human interaction here as well. And now I see another question uh, for uh, Nicola. Does my company need to hire a team of data scientists or there is a more straightforward way of benefiting from supply chain forecasting? Yeah, sure. That, that's, that's also an interesting question. Um, I saw over the last five years different shifts in uh, demand forecasting. Five years ago, company would more hire external people to do the job for them. And then over the, let's say, two, three years ago, my clients started to hire their own data scientists. And then they still came back to me saying, we hired generalists, but now we need someone to coach them because they don't know how to make them a data. So I see really different types, different ways to deal with that. You can go to a, a service provider or software provider to do it for you. You can hire people and then hire someone to coach or train them, or you can hire external consultant to do the model for you, give the model to someone in-house that is going to run, the, run it for you if you have a data scientist, or you can still hire someone, I said, as a service provider, as an external consultant, that's going to make the model and sustain the model for you. It really depends what's your scale and if you want to have or not have your own team of data scientists. I wouldn't say there is a perfect way or there is a worse way to do it. It just depends on what you want to achieve and the, well, the expertise level you have right now. Great. 
Great. Thank you so much uh, for uh, this response. Uh, and now, because um, it is uh, almost five uh, CET, I just want to mention that our um, you see our emails, my email and the email of Nicola in the chat. You can uh, always reach out to us to ask more questions. And also, um, due to the fact that our data scientists couldn't join, if you have some more questions on uh, clarifying, uh, for example, some parts uh, from his slides or something more about the forecasting model, please just um, send me an email and I will connect you to um, our data scientist Ngo Kyung as well. And uh, I would also, uh, I, because I saw a question whether we can share with you the video, uh, of course, we, will sh we can share the recording uh, with the people that attended. We want to thank you so much for uh, your attention. And uh, Nicola, thank you so much for uh, taking part in this webinar. It was a great pleasure for us to have you as guest and um, we are also very excited for other upcoming webinars so stay tuned and we hope to see you there as well thank you uh, Kanya. thank you everyone for um, sharing a question and comments thank you uh, Cinnamon, jeff and uh, alexander for all your question and interaction on the chat and everyone else it, it was a pleasure thank you thank you and we hope to see you all soon again bye bye, bye.